For this evening, we hope to provide you with training to understand background about tobacco, especially tobacco history in this country and abroad, and practical tools to help your patients quit tobacco. So I will be talking to you about general tobacco information, current data, the consequences of tobacco use, second and third hand smoke, the oral manifestations of tobacco use, FDA approved cessation medications. I am a data wonk because I am a public health dentist, but I will not hit you over the head with a lot of data, just the data that I want you to understand in terms of the big picture. So the objectives are in your handout, so I won't read those one by one. So again, I talked to you about my public health interest. Um, we administered a very large tobacco cessation training program here in Arizona. It was funded by the Arizona uh, Department of Health Services. And we had hygienists who I would send out around the county, 10,000 square miles, who would go into dental practices and train those dental practices on how to talk to their patients about tobacco cessation and ultimately refer those patients to the Arizona quit line. We'll talk about the quit lines towards later on in the course, but the quit lines are an excellent resource for your dental practice to uh, refer your patients to. Now, my personal interest here, this is my personal interest. I became an adult orphan at the very young age, early 40s. On the right-hand side is my father. He was a violin virtuoso. He um, started to play the violin at the age of four. He was an engineer. He attended Penn State. And he met my mother at Penn State. They were both 18 years of age when they began to date. My mother's in the front row. She was a cheerleader. She's in the middle. And again, they both began to smoke at a time in US history when one in every two adults smoked tobacco cigarettes. So 50% of the adult population in the United States, they met in 1958, I think, um, smoked. Now, my father quit smoking at the age of 50 years when he had a massive heart attack, um, was not supposed to survive that heart attack. He was on a balloon pump for three weeks in a coma, induced coma, um, and a ventilator. And when he survived that all, uh, the doctor said, Mr. Rowling, I understand you're a smoker. And my father said, I understand I quit three weeks ago. That was the last time he picked up a cigarette. But unfortunately, about 14 years later, he developed lung cancer and he died within about three months. Uh, very aggressive lung cancer. My mother developed COPD. Now, she tried to quit smoking multiple times over her life, but she was a registered nurse and she worked in a locked psychiatric unit for 30 years. Part of her job was to take her patients out for smoking breaks. Patients could smoke in hospitals at one time, believe it or not. And the psychiatric patients, behavioral health patients, have a very high prevalence of tobacco use disorder. So that was my mother's job. She was subjected to quite a bit of secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. Um, for the last 10 years of her life, she was hospitalized um, quite a few times, but she had quit smoking for the last 10 years. In the last three years of her life, she was hospitalized over 50 times for COPD and ultimately um, died from it. So that's my story. I have a personal interest uh, they would be in their 80s right now. And so if you have patients right now who are in their 80s and they have heart disease or some sort of respiratory disease, they might have been smokers um, in the 50s. More than likely, they were. And this is where it all began. So I feel this is an important story to share with you and understand what kind of patients you're facing now. So Again, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to type them into the chat area and I will be checking in with you shortly. 
So let's talk about the problem, tobacco. Tobacco dependence and nicotine addiction is the leading cause of illness and death in the United States. In discussing the tobacco problem, we will review its history, the types of tobacco products, market trends, and then a review of evidence-based strategies for tobacco cessation. The American Dental Association states that its members should become fully informed about tobacco cessation intervention techniques to effectively educate their patients to overcome their addiction to tobacco. Now, I'll also share with you that the dental boards are looking pretty closely at this. There was a case um, in California just a couple of years ago where a dentist was found, alleged and, and found to be practicing below the standard of care for failing to refer their patient to a smoking cessation program and advising them to stop smoking instead went, moved forward with treatment that failed. So many, many state boards are looking at this and we'll talk about what you can do um, to make sure that you can safeguard your practice as well as provide the communication that you need to your patients and help them quit. The Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health Department 2008, came out with guidelines stating that clinicians should strongly recommend the use of effective tobacco dependence counseling and medication treatments to their patients who use tobacco, and that health systems, insurers, and purchasers assist clinicians in making such effective treatment available. And for those of you just joining us, be sure to take a look at those instructions at the top of the chat area and download the two handouts that we've provided for you. So the World Health Organization in 2020, so a little over a year ago, tobacco kills more than 8 million people globally every year, and more than 7 million of these deaths are from direct tobacco use, while around 1.2 million are due to non-smokers being exposed to secondhand smoke. Tobacco smoking is a known risk factor for many respiratory infections, it increases the severity of respiratory disease. And a review of studies by public health experts convened by the World Health Organization April 2020 found that smokers are more likely to develop severe disease with COVID-19 compared to non-smokers. Now, since COVID-19, for the last year and a half, when I present this course and I present the three-hour uh, certification course, I've had many of my learners tell me that they have more and more patients um, confiding in them that they quit smoking because of COVID. And that is great. We're going to be looking at some data here. Unfortunately, statistically, less than 3% a year are successful in quitting less than 3%. So it's incumbent upon you to congratulate them and still get them referred to a quit line because it's just a very, very difficult addiction. Now, Health Policy Watch a year ago, here's subtle tobacco industry advertising tactics hook adolescents, say World Health Organization experts. Because so many of our patients who were smokers or are smokers have attempted to quit because of COVID-19, the tobacco industry, always on top of things in terms of marketing, had to look at other ways to bring people back into that addiction or to hook, for instance, adolescents. So in light of millions of smokers attempting to quit the vice during the COVID-19 pandemic, the industry has employed, quote, very mean, very subtle, and very targeted tactics to hook young populations to deadly tobacco products. That's the World Health Organization. I have a link to that article for you in the handout. What is even more alarming, though, is that, and this is from STOP, which is Stopping Tobacco Organizations and Products, They've been producing a regular COVID-19 monitoring brief, which details trends and patterns of tobacco industry behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And if you go to the link in the handout, you are going to see how the tobacco industry has used, quote, corporate social responsibility to protect profits during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to show you a brief video here, but basically what they're doing is they are approaching governments, third world countries, nonprofits, and so forth. They're donating PPE. They're donating vaccine. They're funding vaccine development in the name of corporate social responsibility, because at the end of the day, they can't, they can't afford to lose smokers, right? And in terms of negotiation with lobbyists for the federal government, the state governments, NGOs, and so forth, it shows a good faith effort. Hey, we're going to uh, supply your country with PPE or vaccines, but hey, how can we loosen up the tobacco restrictions here a little bit? Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say that because we're going to be looking at the next screen here in a second, but let's go ahead and take a quick look at this video. And if you can't hear the video, this is browser based. So I have the link for you in the handout and in the chat area. But this explains to you what the, the tobacco industry is doing now and how it could actually be affecting your patients. When companies appear to value societal goals over profits, it is called corporate social responsibility. Tobacco companies use this tactic as a Trojan horse to increase power and prevent anti-tobacco laws, according to public health experts. One year in, COVID-19 has proven a threat to big tobacco profits. Smokers have more severe COVID-19 symptoms <coughs> and tobacco companies could be asked to pay for the costs of the pandemic. The tobacco industry has used corporate social responsibility to counter this threat. Companies like British American Tobacco, Philip Morris International and Japan Tobacco International have donated to COVID-19 relief in over 25 countries. Evidence suggests that they did this to increase influence with officials. For instance, British American Tobacco donated protective equipment in Bangladesh, but behind closed doors they were lobbying the government to continue cigarette production during lockdown. Or look at Philip Morris International, a multi-million dollar company that profits from lung disease, but donated ventilators to Greek hospitals. Now, the boss of Philip Morris has been taking part in COVID-19 vaccine discussions with the Greek Prime Minister. Yet Greece has some of the highest smoking rates in Europe. Tobacco companies are using corporate social responsibility to protect profits by challenging governments and the World Health Organization while they are most vulnerable. Big tobacco charity is a distraction that prevents society holding the industry accountable for the suffering it causes. Visit tobaccotactics.org for more information. Okay, so there's a link to that in your handout if you want to know more. But um, for instance here, the tobacco industry participation in vaccine development, the industry has investments, tobacco industry and biotechnology companies, pharmaceuticals, some that are involved in the COVID-19 vaccine development. And they do this in the name of, or to appear as part of the solution or, um, getting in the back door again to continue to produce tobacco products in countries that may be in lockdown or they see a decline in use and sales. It may represent one of the most successful corporate public relations strategies ever mounted by a tobacco company. And if you look on your next um, page in your handout, you'll see there, if you go to the link, it's fascinating. There's a database and you can pull up the tobacco com company, you can filter it by country and you can see what they've donated during a particular time. And you'll see uh, some of them are actually manufacturing PPE. 
Um, they're donating PPE to companies, face masks, hand sanitizer, um, vaccines, etc. One donated two billion dollars um, in Brazil. Look at the the um, COVID nineteen crisis in Brazil, and during that time, again, you had the tobacco industry there manipulating the government to be able to continue to sell their products when we know that it increases the risk for uh, death because of COVID-19. So I wanted you to see that. It's a good backstory because it's very parallel to what happened in this country during the US when children were targeted by tobacco um, ads and so forth. Prevalence of tobacco use. Tobacco use is a worldwide epidemic that makes it a pandemic. Its use continues to be the leading global cause of pre preventable death, uh, leading cause of several of the major deaths worldwide, cardiovascular disease, COPD, and lung cancer, and tobacco is responsible for one in 10 deaths globally. It causes hundreds of billions of dollars of economic damage worldwide each year. And many of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. This disparity is expected to widen further over the next several decades. And if the current trends continue over the course of the 21st century, tobacco use could kill a billion people or more. Now, the first public health campaign against tobacco was considered to be this publication by King James VI of Scotland, a counterblast to tobacco in 1604, and he stated it was a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs. So he was clearly a man ahead of his time. The Civil War also became a ma mass market which contributed to the tobacco pandemic, and that was considered the first wave. The invention of magazines and marketing so this was the way to introduce an overseas market. And oftentimes children were depicted in these advertisements using tobacco products. The invention of the match made lighting cigarettes simple. So prior to that, you were lighting your cigarette or cigar or pipe over a fire or a wood burning stove. But oftentimes, orphans called street urchins were used to sell cigarettes and matches and newspapers on the streets of the uh, large metro areas. Cigarettes were also tied to motivation, marketing and weight loss, for instance. So here's Lucky Strike, keep a slender figure no one can deny marketing and health benefits. We have physicians saying luckies are a smoother smoke. And then of course, our dentist marketing here, Viceroy's as your dentist, I would recommend Viceroy's. Now, the American Dental Association in 1964 adopted its first resolution that the association could continue to educate or should continue to educate and inform its membership and the public about the many health hazards attributed to the use of tobacco products, particularly cigarettes, pipes, cigars, and smokeless tobacco, and of course, added to that now electronic cigarettes. Hitler banned cigarette smoking. This is thought to be the first public health campaign of the 20th century. He vehemently opposed smoking. German scientists studied the effects of tobacco use and lung disease. He suppressed, or the Nazis suppressed tobacco use High tobacco taxes were imposed. Hitler banned smoking in German universities, government buildings, public transportation, Nazi party offices. Restaurants were not permitted to sell cigarettes to female patrons. And it is thought that Hitler launched the first public health anti-smoking campaign. After Germany surrendered, ironically, cigarettes became a surrogate currency. There's some Hitler propaganda or Nazi propaganda. The German woman does not smoke. Of course, the very famous Tipperillo advertisement. Um, here, would a gentleman offer a dental hygienist a Tipperillo? Uh, if you don't know about Tipperillo's 
from what I remember, and Dr. Birchman, I am giving my age away here, Tipperillo advertisements were these um, very slinky women on TV that would walk around restaurants with a silver tray and they would say cigars, cigarettes, tipperillos. Tipperillos were considered sort of a luxury smoke, a cross between a cigar and a cigarette. But they often targeted primarily women um, occupations, turned them into these sort of sex idols to um, lure the male smoker into purchasing them, I guess. So tobacco is a major risk factor in all the leading causes of death, except for accidents and Alzheimer's and over 480,000 tobacco related deaths yearly, surpassing all other preventable causes of death combined. That is in a non COVID-19 year, of course. Unintentional injuries may be cigarette related and directly due to house fires. So it's estimated that cigarettes are the number one cause of fire death in the US because cigarettes are self burning. They sustain, they are, they are designed to continue to burn whether or not the user is puffing on the cigarette. And they're designed that way by two layers of paper that are chemically treated with burn rings. So if you ever see an ash, you'll see sort of those fine rings, but the ash will stay intact and the cigarette will continue to burn. So the user falls asleep on a couch or in bed, the cigarette rolls off or whatever and causes the house fire. Leading causes of death in the US in the relationship to tobacco, cardiovascular disease, number one, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, or otherwise known as COPD, stroke, accidents, Alzheimer's, diabetes, influenza, and pneumonia. Annual global deaths, according to the World Health Organization, tobacco is a risk factor for six of the eight leading causes of death, as we stated. It's the single greatest preventable cause of death in the world today, and it kills five point more 5.4 million people a year. The US is in the top five globally for cigarette consumption. China is one, followed by Russia, the US, Indonesia, and then Japan. World cigarette consumption, America's 11%, Europe 24%, um, Africa 3%, Southeast 8%, Western Pacific 48%, and Eastern Mediterranean, 6%. So the US accounts for 11% of the global cigarette consumption. And over the past 100 years, global consumption has increased 100 times. So in 1880, the first automatic cigarette rolling machine was invented. It was purchased by uh, Buck Duke, who owned the majority of the tobacco industry at that time. And that is what really launched the market, plus the other marketing, invention of matches, the railroad, the Civil War, et cetera, was sort of a um, come together point in history that launched this industry. Okay, trends in cigarette smoking rates, they've fallen significantly for both youths and adults. And while they have fallen, the tobacco industry has um, looked for other ways to get nicotine into the systems of addicts. Smoking rates by sex, we see men typically smoke more than women. If we look at the age, you notice that the 25 to 44 year old age group for tobacco cigarettes um, is almost neck and neck with 45 to 64. The 18 to 24 year old age group we see a larger prevalence for electronic cigarettes. If you want to know more about electronic cigarettes, we'll be touching base a little bit this evening, but I give an entire course on electronic cigarettes as well. If you notice though, there is a very large drop off between 64 age, uh, age and then the 65 and over crowd. What happens at the age of 64? Does somebody wake up one morning and decide 
today's the day I'm going to stop smoking after 50 years. Probably not. What happens is they acquire some sort of disease that prevents them from picking up a cigarette again. Okay. Something catastrophic. Usually it's a heart attack or stroke or lung cancer, lung resection. They're on a trach, something like that. So we see this disease impact this data between 64 and 65. So that is due to tobacco use related illness. Smoking rates by race and ethnicity. Um, I'm here in Arizona. We, we have a very high population of Native American and Alaska Natives. A lot of Alaska Natives will come here to work and so forth. 26.9%, very large. So they are the population with the highest rate. Um, this is followed by Caucasians, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. By education. So we know smoking rates are highest for those with less than a high school education or a high school diploma or GED. So the more educated the user is, the less likely they are using tobacco, right? So if you get up to bachelor's or higher, we see 5.6%. Smoking rates by income, unfortunately, they're highest for those with family income below the poverty threshold. Now, that's interesting data. We'll also see that behavioral health patients or psychiatric patients also have the highest use rate of tobacco. And so there could be some link there as well. If the person's mentally ill, they may not be financially stable. Smoking rates by sexual identity. Smoking rates are higher among gay, lesbian, or bisexual individuals compared to straight individuals. Health insurance coverage. Those on Medicaid and who are uninsured smoke at over twice the rate as those with private insurance. And again, that could be tied to the federal poverty level, um, behavioral health issues, race, et cetera. Smoking rates by urban versus rural. We see rural uh, slightly higher. Dual use of cigarettes and e-cigarettes by adults. So here's what I want you to understand about electronic cigarettes. The majority of your patients, and hopefully you're asking them about their electronic cigarette use, are dual users. They got sold a bill of goods by the electronic cigarette companies that e-cigarettes were going to help them quit smoking. Tobacco cigarettes. They end up, because they are addicted to nicotine, using both. About 78 to 79% use both tobacco cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. And electronic cigarettes, one disposable electronic cigarette has as much nicotine as an entire pack of tobacco cigarettes. Among current users of electronic cigarettes, 41% also currently smoke, 38% formally smoked, and that was data of 2018. And again, it's it's estimated now that they are 78% are dual users. And many that get hooked on electronic cigarettes never picked up a tobacco cigarette in their life. Many of them believe it's not harmful. So many of your patients think electronic cigarettes are a safer alternative to tobacco cigarettes. And that has to do a lot with the marketing early on. Because tobacco healthcare policy was just that. Electronic cigarettes did not fit into that healthcare policy initially. Anyways, we delve into that quite deeply in our electronic cigarette course. So, again, if you want to know more, be sure to sign up for that. And it's also available on demand on our website. The US tobacco epidemic then and now, again, we said each year nearly a half a million Americans die. To tobacco due to tobacco use. That's one in five U.S. deaths. That's $300 billion per year attributed to smoking, um, $132 to $175.9 billion for direct medical care of adults. My mother was hospitalized multiple times, as I shared with you. One of her bills from Kaiser Hospital was over $120,000 um, for just a couple of weeks. 
of hospital stay because of COPD. $150 billion for loss of productivity due to premature deaths. That is taking someone out of the workforce who is trained, for instance, like my father um, and my mother, who both died of tobacco use early on in their careers. $35 per pack, health-related costs per smoker. So you have someone that smokes a pack a day for 40 years, add that up. Mid-1960s, as we said, 50% of Americans smoked more men than women. And then in 1965, when the Surgeon General's report first came out, we saw a decline. And when that decline occurred, that is when the tobacco companies stepped up their game and started to heavily market um, tobacco. And then they've had to change their course as healthcare policy has emerged, for instance, workplace smoking, et cetera. And they've converted now quite a bit to smokeless tobacco and electronic cigarettes. For the first time in U.S. history, we now see more former smokers than current smokers. So back in 1965, again, about 50% of the U.S. population used tobacco cigarettes, more men than women. That has declined until 2013. We see about 20.5% men, 15.3% women, total adult prevalence, 17.8%. And that is um, current data as well as uh, pertains today as well. So take home message, slightly more men than women. Also, the number of cigarettes per day has changed significantly due to workplace bans and smoking restrictions. So back in the 1970s, we saw more people use or smoke greater than 24 cigarettes per day. So that was more than a pack a day. But now we see, and this is as of 2009, uh, more that's more that smoke less than 15 cigarettes per day. That has to do again with workplace restrictions and smoking restrictions. I know when I've been with various public health departments, we were tested periodically for tobacco use. And if nicotine showed up in our bloodstream, we paid more for our health insurance. Fortunately, mine never did. Okay. So let's talk now about intermittent smokers. Intermittent smokers are weekend smokers. They're the weekend warriors. They're the patients that are going to tell you, hey, doc, you know, yeah, I smoke a couple of cigarettes on the weekends. I'm sure you've heard this. Um, I'm out with friends, or at least in a non-COVID year, I may be out with friends. I'm having a drink, having something to eat. Yeah, I like a couple of cigarettes on the weekends. They're still addicted, Okay. So light cigarettes for purposes here would be less than 10 cigarettes per day. Heavy cigarettes greater than 11. Both intermittent and daily light smokers are likely to express less concern about tobacco addiction. They are still addicted. And unfortunately for this group, they are tough to convert to the non-smoker status because they don't tie their withdrawal symptoms to their tobacco use. Their withdrawal symptoms are delayed. So when we talk about referring to the quit lines, the quit lines are going to interview these smokers, find out what kind of a smoker they are, because they can gear their cessation for that. But they can have delayed withdrawal symptoms. Nearly two-thirds of the world's smokers live in 10 countries. This is a CDC poster, but it states pretty succinctly here that cigarette smoking may be down, uh, but about 34 million American adults still smoke. Cigarette smoking remains high among certain groups. Again, more men, adults 25 to 64, lower education, below the poverty level, the Midwest and South, the uninsured or Medicaid, disabled, uh, the behavioral health, 
mentally ill patient, um, Alaskan Native, Native Americans, or multiracial, and then lesbian, gay, and bisexuals. The strategies, according to the CDC, implement smoke-free laws, run mass media campaigns, raise tobacco prices, so tobacco taxation has worked in many states, and make the quit lines easier to access. Any questions or comments before we move forward with health consequences of tobacco use? Okay, let's go ahead then and move forward. So the policy statement, the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics states that nicotine addiction begins as a pediatric disease. In 2006, for instance, 3 million young people aged 12 to 17 used cigarettes. 3,000 became regular users each day. And we know that one third will eventually die from a tobacco related disease. Tobacco effects are specific to women, children, and infants. Evidence indicates that young people can become tobacco dependent in just a few weeks of initiation. Sometimes it can be within a few cigarettes. There are studies that indicate that as well. The CDC reports that each day more than 3,200 persons under the years of age or under the age of 18 smoke their first cigarette and an estimated 2,100 youth and young adults who have been occasional smokers become daily cigarette smokers. The 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report on smoking and health estimates that 5.6 million of today's children will ultimately die early from smoking if we do not do more to reduce current smoking rates. Now, in the 1970s, this marketing campaign was focused on women. Virginia Slims, because at that time it was the feminist movement, Bella Abzug, um, women's liberation, ban the bra, all of that stuff. And Virginia Slims said, let's target women and let's focus on making them feel empowered if they use tobacco products. So you would see Wonder Woman, you would see these jingles, you've come a long way, baby. Um, I remember these jingles and gosh, I was very young at that time. So the marketing at this juncture was very, very stealth. Tobacco industry marketing is so effective. If you've not watched the, H, I think it's HBO series, Mad Men, take a look, binge watch Mad Men sometime. It's all about the tobacco industry actually and marketing. So you'll see these people rolling out of bed and lighting a cigarette and um, how sort of corrupt many of them were, but it all had to do with how they were going to get cigarettes into the hands of users. So here we have, we make Virginia Slims, especially for women, because they are biologically superior to men. You've come a long way, baby. Now, we know that about 250 million women in the world are daily smokers, and about 22% of women in developed countries and 9% of women in developing countries smoke tobacco. In 2013, 15.3% of women smoked. Smoking rates for female adolescents declined while rising in the 25 to 44 year old age group for women. So 17.1%, the 45 to 64 year old age group, 18.1%. And since 1980, 3 million women have died due to smoking-related illness, and since 1987, lung cancer has killed more women than breast cancer. 30% of high school girls report smoking in the past month. There are unique health risks to women smokers, adverse health effects during pregnancy, 
increased risk of cervical cancer, reduced fertility, increased risk of coronary heart disease if smoking and taking oral contraceptives at the same time, earlier natural menopause, and lower bone density post-menopause. Okay, let's talk about an anatomy of a cigarette. Um, I see a few of you have just jumped on. Be sure to read the instructions at the top of the screen. And this would be a good point to go ahead and take quick roll for AGD Pace. So please go ahead and type yes into the chat area so that we know you are here. Okay, thank you. So anatomy of a cigarette. A cigarette is a tube. It's a tube of paper that is filled with tobacco. That's basically what it is, but we're gonna get into a little bit more detail here. So the cigarette itself, the paper wrap is two layers of paper chemically treated to create the burn rings that you see in the diagram. And those burn rings will help sustain the burn of that cigarette. The tobacco is a reconstituted tobacco, meaning that it is uh, dried very carefully and there are tons of chemicals added to that tobacco to sustain burning, um, to help with the flavor of the cigarette, to make it less harsh on the lungs and to help absorb more nicotine into one system so that they will become even more addicted to the nicotine. The filter tip, the filter tip was designed when the Surgeon General's report came out um, and actually shortly before when there were concerns that cigarette smoking may cause lung disease. So the tobacco industry responded by saying, okay, um, let's market these cigarettes to make them look safer. How can we do that? We'll create a filter. So if you notice the ventilation holes in that filter tip, unfortunately, the nicotine addict will use the cigarette in a way that they can put their lips over the holes and block the airflow and basically titrate their own drug. So they, they will get more nicotine per hit that way. The machines that test these cigarettes especially those with the filters made like this or designed like this, they don't have lips. Right? So that's the difference. So the filter has been found to not really protect anybody from the harmful effects of tobacco use. So again, the tobacco inside the cigarette is made up partly of tobacco leaves. Most of the tobacco is reconstituted. It's been treated with nicotine and up to 600 chemical additives, including ammonia to enhance absorption and chocolate to mask the bitter taste. The puffed or expanded tobacco is a freeze-dried product that is also found in cigarettes. The paper wrap is made up of two different thicknesses, again, chemically treated to create a series of burn rings. And it's this feature that is contributing to the cigarette-caused fires. The filter was introduced in 1954. There is no evidence that filters reduce the risk of smoking. Light cigarettes are also marketed because they have additional ventilation holes around the filter to allow additional air in. But because the machines, again, do not cover these holes, 
the test results for these cigarettes can create an impression that the lower tar nicotine is delivered. So smokers will usually cover these holes with their lips, but they still think they're doing something that is healthier for them. There are approximately 600 ingredients in cigarettes, and when burned, they create more than 4,800 compounds, including 11 human carcinogens. Many of these chemicals are also found in consumer products, but these products have warning labels. While the public is warned about the danger of the poisons in these products, there is no such warning for the toxins in tobacco smoke. If you walk into a dry cleaning plant, they will list the chemicals in that dry cleaning plant, like toluene and so forth, which you also find in cigarettes, but you will not see that on the packet of cigarettes. Nicotine does not cause the ill health effects of tobacco. Nicotine is the psychoaddictive drug. And for more research, um, you can go to, this is ucsf.edu, which is my own monitor, but there's a lot of information at stanford.edu as well. So some of the toxins in cigarettes, acetone, acetic acid, ammonia, arsenic, benzene, butane, cadmium, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, hexamine, hexavalent chromium, hydrogen cyanide, lead, naphthalene, nitrosamines, methanol, polonium-210, tar, and then toluene. The interesting thing about formaldehyde is that electronic cigarettes produce formaldehyde-releasing agents. So many of the users of electronic cigarettes that make their own devices will swap out the potentiometer to send more current to the, uh, the coil and they will heat up the electronic juice or liquid to very, very high temperatures and in the presence of the oxygen will create these formaldehyde releasing agents. And it is thought that electronic cigarettes could carry a risk factor for cancer that is 15 times greater than tobacco cigarettes or gaseous formaldehyde produced by tobacco cigarettes. So nicotine is a potent parasympathomimetic alkaloid. It is found in the nightshade family of plants. It is a stimulant. So tobacco plant is a nightshade plant. It is manufactured in the roots of the tobacco plant and it accumulates in the leaves of these plants as a way to deter insects and birds from eating the leaves. So it's an anti-herbivore. It was used widely as an insecticide. It was sprayed on crops, for instance. So we're going to talk now about electronic nicotine delivery systems. Any questions or comments before we do? Okay, again, this is um, an overview of electronic cigarettes. If you want the entire course, we do have it available on the website as on demand, and then I present it um, occasionally as a live course. I think coming up again is August. So electronic cigarettes are, well, inclusive electronic cigarettes, we'll be talking about e-pens, e-pipes, e-hookahs, e-cigars, known collectively as electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS. And according to the FDA, e-cigarettes are devices that allow users to inhale an aerosol. It's not really a vapor. It contains particulate matter. It also contains nicotine and other substances like formaldehyde, uh, or formaldehyde releasing agents, um, flavorings, and so forth. Unlike traditional tobacco cigarettes, 
E-cigarettes generally are battery operated and they use a heating element to heat e-liquid from either a fillable cartridge or manually filled, releasing a chemical filled aerosol. It's created by the extraction of nicotine from tobacco and then mixed with a base like propylene glycol or vegetable glycerin, and then flavorings are added, colorings, and so forth, as well as chemicals. Now, early on in 2006, when electronic cigarettes first reached the shores here, or 2008, um, there was no federal oversight of electronic cigarettes. The U.S. government wasn't quite sure how to react. The public health system wasn't sure how to react. Uh, the electronic cigarette, the e-liquid, many of these products were advertised as zero nicotine or nicotine free. And when they were tested, it was found out that in fact, they did contain nicotine. Um, they could be sold to minors. You could purchase the parts online and make your own devices. So the horse was out of the barn for about 10 years before the government was able to identify what electronic cigarettes were. Were they going to be a medical device? Um, was the FDA going to have oversight? And then how was it going to be regulated? So this was a study early on that linked electronic cigarettes to popcorn lung, also known as bronchiolitis obliterans. And it was found to be caused by flavoring chemicals in these e-cigarettes like diacetyl, for instance. In this particular study, the conclusion was that due to the associations being between diacetyl, bronchiolitis obliterans, and other severe respiratory diseases observed in workers, urgent action was recommended to further evaluate the potentially widespread exposure of the flavored e-cigarette. Now the flavorings were added. Can anybody tell me why flavorings were added to these electronic cigarettes? There's a question for you. Hopefully some folks will chime in with some answers. Definitely to promote sales. Yep, Jessica, good. Definitely Andrea's right. Yep, to track the kids. Yes, get the younger population. So we see that a lot of the flavorings led to names like um, gummy bear, flavored e-liquid, cotton candy, Starburst, um, those aren't flavors marketed to adults. Those are flavors to target young children. So safety of electronic cigarettes. We're finding out more and more about electronic cigarettes, but they're still largely unregulated because you can purchase parts online and make these devices yourself. It was not under the oversight of the FDA um, and the federal government gave quite a bit of the responsibility over to the states. So you'll see varying state statute, whether they're protecting minors, where you can use the products, if you can use them in public and so forth. There are 500 brands and 7,700 flavors that we know of. Um, and these flavors have not been evaluated by the FDA. You can go into a mom and pop shop and buy what you want. Walk in someday and just take a look. You'll be amazed. E uh, disclosure warning labels or limiting youth access were not required by law in some states, even though the federal government has changed that. Um, again, mom and pop shops are not inspected. And so basically anybody can walk in there and purchase these. E-cigarettes expose others to secondhand vapor containing formaldehyde and other harmful chemicals. E-cigarettes are advertised sometimes as nicotine free, as we said, 
but they've been tested and they are not nicotine free. And in addition, there are other components, chemicals in that e-liquid that can be just as dangerous. Consumers may be under the impression um, that these are healthy alternatives to smoking or they're going to help them quit smoking. A 2014 study showed a widely ranging amount of nicotine in products of the same company, of the same brand. Again, speaking to the fact that they are not well regulated. So nicotine is addictive. No matter what form you get your nicotine, uh, the more you get nicotine, let's say, the greater the addiction potential. So the more that you use, if you're creating your devices with greater potentiometers to create more vapor or more aerosol, you are creating more nicotine. And the more nicotine you absorb, the greater potential for addiction. Now, newer e-cigarette devices, again, especially the tank styles with higher voltage, deliver a greater concentration of nicotine. Nicotine negatively impacts health. For example, adolescent brain development. And nicotine is not safe at any level. The U.S. Surgeon General has found exposure to nicotine during pregnancy harms the developing fetus. It causes lasting consequences for brain and lung function in newborns. Its exposure also affects maternal and fetal health during pregnancy and can result in low birth weight, preterm delivery, and stillbirth. Can electronic cigarettes help someone quit smoking? So the FDA has not determined that any e-cigarette is safe and effective in helping someone quit smoking. Many e-cigarette users continue to use tobacco cigarettes as well. As we said earlier, 76.8% of the people who recently used e-cigarettes were current tobacco cigarette smokers. The U.S. Surgeon General has determined that even smoking a few cigarettes a day is dangerous to your health. And there are seven FDA-approved drugs to help smokers quit. Electronic cigarettes are not approved. E-cigarette use among children utilization tripled initially from 2011 to 2013, surpassing tobacco cigarette use. This has to do with aggressive marketing tactics to appeal to youth, flavors, as we said, like cotton candy and Fruit Loops, and a recent publication in the Journal of Health Economics, October 2015, concluded that a significant increase in tobacco cigarettes use among adolescents occurred in states that had banned electronic cigarettes to minors. So it speaks to the fact that they are addicted to nicotine. Now, many of them will turn to electronic cigarettes because they won't smell like tobacco smoke. So they can use them on the school grounds. Um, parents aren't going to find out or use them, you know, at social events and so forth. So electronic cigarette marketing, targeting youth, definitely through flavors, through advertisements. So views blue, and we see now that um, electronic cigarettes are even advertised during the dinner hour on TV. You don't see tobacco cigarettes advertised on TV, and the reason is we have federal laws that prevent that. You cannot advertise cigarettes in magazines like this. But because these are electronic cigarettes, different laws, okay? Smokeless tobacco marketed as a safe alternative to smoking cigarettes. When I'm talking about smokeless tobacco, I'm talking about snuff and snus. However, we know that is not the case. Smokeless tobacco contains 28 carcinogens, the amount of nicotine absorbed from smokeless tobacco can be three to four times that of a tobacco cigarette. 
smokeless tobacco is addictive and harmful and should not be considered a safer alternative to smoking. That was the National Cancer Institute back in 1992. Health risks of smokeless tobacco long-term use has been associated with greater risk of heart attack and stroke, increased risk for oral esophageal and pancreatic cancer, increased oral inflammation of tissues, periodontal disease and dental caries, um, absent the effects of combustion of tobacco, high levels of nicotine and nitrosamines, major contributors to the health effects associated with its use. So snuff is sold in these tea bags right now. Um, you can get them in tea bags or sachets. And because many workplaces have instituted a smoke-free work policy, one could simply pack, pick up these little discrete pouches and use them in your workplace. And you don't have to worry about where you're going to spit out that big blob of tobacco soaked uh, with saliva, right? Roll your owns. So federal taxes and state taxes have caused an increase in roll your owns. Federal and state taxes of tobacco cigarettes have been a very effective way to reduce the use. And because of that, um, those that can't afford all the taxes will roll their own. Dissolvables. So dissolvable cigarettes are these candy-like forms of smokeless tobacco. And they're available as um, lozenges. They're sweet flavored. They may be flavored um, with candy-like flavors. Also orbs or pellets or strips like the melt-away breath strips or toothpick-sized sticks. They all contain tobacco and nicotine. And depending on the type, they're designed to be held in the mouth, chewed or sucked until they dissolve, and then the juices are swallowed. Some of these new smokeless tobacco products are mint flavored. They look a lot like candy and because they are so tempting, they can easily poison children and pets. Okay, we're gonna talk next about the effects of smoking and tobacco use. Any questions or comments? So this photo depicts sort of what I remember from health class and tobacco um, in high school, right? They always showed you the black lung, the jar, the lung in the jar that that the smoker used and, you know, try to use the fear tactics on everyone. Um, and then, of course, on the left-hand side, the healthy pink lung. So effects of smoking and tobacco use on the cardiovascular system. We know that uh, tobacco use can lead to atherosclerosis, hardening or occlusion of the blood vessels. The platelets can become sticky and an increased potential for blood clot formation. Chronic inflammation of the blood vessel linings. It can impede the ability of the vessels to dilate and contract. It can lower the good HDL cholesterol and raise the bad LDL cholesterol. It increases heart rate and blood pressure. Carbon monoxide that is produced from tobacco use can displace oxygen in the blood. It can cause vasoconstriction and ultimately the heart becomes robbed of oxygen. Effects on the respiratory system are reversible early on. 
So tobacco use, tobacco smoking can be an irritant to the tissues, but over time it can become a permanent condition. It can cause progressive tissue destruction, fibrosis. And although there is no evidence that nicotine causes lung cancer, however, in those diagnosed, poor treatment response and shorter survival, survival rates occur. Hi, so no, you won't get instruction for CE yet until the end of the course. If you take a look at the top of the chat area, you'll see the instructions there. Um, it will tell you all about it. There are two handouts for you. One is how to get your CE verification. All right, emphysema, 90% of the cases due to smoking, chronic bronchitis, asthma, COPD, which is two or more of the following conditions, emphysema, chron bro chronic bronchitis, asthma, is the third leading cause of death. 85 to 90% of those cases are due to smoking. Women who smoked are 13 times more likely to die from COPD than those who never smoked. Lung cancer is 27% of cancer deaths, leading cause of all cancer deaths, 13% cancers diagnosed. And as we said earlier in the 1980s, lung cancer surpassed breast cancer deaths in women. Oral health and effects on the oral cavity. We all have seen them. We all know about them. We're going to talk about them now. One of the things that we'll talk about when we have the conversation with our patients about their tobacco use, many of them know about the cardiovascular risk. Many of them know about the respiratory risk. Many of them do not know that they could lose their teeth if they continue to use tobacco products and perhaps electronic cigarettes. So that is a way to incorporate your conversation, tie it to their oral health, not as a fear factor, but as an obligation to let them know what their prognosis is if they continue to use tobacco products. So in addition to the harmful effects on the respiratory and cardiovascular systems, tobacco use has significant adverse effects on oral health. Harmful effects vary from reduced ability to smell and taste to staining, and discoloration of the teeth and dental restorations, implant failure, periodontal problems, and oral cancer. Now, snuff is the smokeless tobacco, and snuff is a dry or moist product that comes in a can, right? We'll talk about that. And again, they can they tend to hold it between their lip and the facial surfaces of their teeth or the buccal surface and the posterior area. And if you lifted that lip, you'd see a corrugated sort of accordion pleat of whitish tissue, right? Concerning looking tissue. You may see some caries there, definitely see some staining and some recession. 50% of periodontal disease cases are linked to smoking, either current smokers or previous. Definitely staining, staining of the restorations, smoking major risk again for oral and pharyngeal cancers, 75% of oral cancers, mouth, tongue, lips, throat, nose, larynx, six times the risk for oral cancer. Oral cancer occurs male to female, two to one. 40 years ago, it was five to one. Cigar smoking can cause oral cancer without inhaling. So you may have patients that tell you, I use cigars. So they think they're safe, but they aren't. Um, they don't have to inhale the cigar to still have a risk for oral cancer. As I said, tooth loss is two to three times higher in smokers and the majority of your smoking patients don't know that. So we have an obligation to let them know that their prognosis is poor. If they continue to use tobacco products, 
they could lose their teeth and there's nothing we can do for them. So we have to help them stop. Smokeless tobacco causes gingival recession, white lesions, Combined with excessive alcohol use, it contributes to the high risk of developing oral cancers associated with chronic bad breath, loss of taste, and salivary changes. Now, let me ask you all this, and there's no right or right, right or wrong answer. When you have a patient that you will be extracting a tooth, maybe they've come in, they have an infection, you're going to give them antibiotics, you see they're a smoker, you give them the preoperative and postoperative instructions. What do you tell your patients that are smokers when you're going to extract a tooth? Again, no right or wrong answer. Reduced healing, dry socket, stop smoking. Uh, 48 hours, two weeks, seven days. Okay. So more likely to get a dry socket, post-operative complications. Exactly. So let's think about this here. We have an addiction and I, I did the same thing my entire career. Many of my patients in public health were smokers. Um, Many of them had healing issues and dry sockets, right? So the problem here is that we're telling an addict to stop using their drug of choice for just a couple of days. You know, stop becoming an addict because we're going to take this tooth out um, and it may give you a dry socket. Uh, it may cause you to develop infection or delay your healing. That's not going to happen. Nicotine addiction is a very, very strong addiction. So we need tools in our tool chest to help them because they we, we can't expect someone to immediately not use their drug of choice without some help. The problem here is that if you have them, they walk into your practice that day and you're taking out a tooth, or even if you have them coming back in three days, the chances are they're not, they're not going to be able to do that. So um, there is a modality that you should consider using in your practice anyways. Dr. Birchman is here. It's called photobiomodulation. You can use an LED device that is specific for photobiomodulation, or you may even have lasers in your practice that you can uh, dial in the particular wavelength. But using photobiomodulation before you take that tooth out, before you extract it, and afterwards will help reduce the dry socket complication and improve the healing. And we see in studies that that can also assist your smokers. So if you don't know about photobiomodulation, it has many, many, many benefits. Um, that is just one of them. It speeds up the healing of herpetic lesions. Dr. Birchman will actually be presenting August 21st, a course on COVID-19, treating the oral manifestations using photobiomodulation and LED technology. The technology, use a dedicated device, very cost effective. You can use it for TMD, your endodontics, analgesia. You will reduce the need to prescribe Opioids, Dr. Ross has not prescribed opioids in 10 years. Go to the website um, and you will see the course for August 21st. It's a symposium, no charge to you. And I'm also going to put their website in here as a shameless plug, because if you don't know about this technology, you really need to learn about it.
I need to learn how to type this evening. I have the new glasses on and I can't see. Okay. You go to gmaleasereducation.com training. The link is there in the chat area. You will see recorded courses, no charge. You'll see upcoming courses in August and September. They have a comprehensive training in um, November. And then be sure to watch the symposium on August 21st because that is an amazing amount of material. Dr. Birchman has done quite a bit of research and he is a leading expert in photobiomodulation. All right, so again, what can we do for these patients that we know are going to have reduced healing? Photobiomodulation is a major consideration. In hospital settings, medicine knows that when they have someone who is a smoker and they are admitted to the hospital, they are at a higher risk of cardiac and respiratory complications, higher risk of post-operative infection, impaired wound healing. They are more likely to be admitted to the ICU. There is um, increased risk of death in the hospital and hospitalized longer. Yes, Dr. Birchman has PBM is also great to treat uh, dry sockets. That's that's how I started off, Dr. Birchman. And PBM, for those that you don't know, um, stands for photobiomodulation. So we know, we've done a feasibility study. Uh, we know that about 87% of you all do not know about photobiomodulation. And Dr. Birchman... Dr. Aaron Darbar, who's the current president of the Academy of Laser Dentistry, and Dr. Jerry Ross is one of the past presidents of the North America Association for Photobiomodulation. It's their mission to teach this evidence-based modality to you all so that you can incorporate it in your dental practice. It's that important. Again, it's very cost-effective, and your patients are going to be extremely satisfied if they don't need local anesthesia or they need less, they don't have post-operative complaints. Um, it is a true practice builder. Okay, so again, hospitals know that patients who are smokers don't fare well after procedures. They have an increased risk of dying while they're in the hospital and they're hospitalized longer. Smoking and behavioral health patients, um, Tobacco use is two to four times higher in populations with mental health disorders. 44% of cigarettes consumed by those with mental illness and or other addictions. Of the 480,000 annual deaths, 200,000 occur among those who are mentally ill and or afflicted with substance abuse disorders. Smoking cessation has been associated with greater abstinence from other drug use after completion of drug abuse treatment, okay? So many of the uh, drug rehab centers know now that the majority of their residents, if you will, if they're in um, admitted, are tobacco users. So they will mandate that they abstain from all cigarettes as well as other drugs. So whether it's alcohol, heroin, methamphetamine, whatever the case may be, cocaine. Significant reductions in smoking can occur without adverse effects on psychiatric symptoms. Let's talk now about secondhand smoke. So the effects of secondhand smoke, secondhand smoke is known as environmental tobacco smoke. It is the combination of the side stream smoke from the end of the cigarette that's still burning 
and then the mainstream smoke that is exhaled by the smoker, okay? Secondhand smoke is a class A carcinogen like asbestos, radon, benzene. It is a serious health hazard and it causes more than 41 deaths each year. Almost 60% of US children aged three to 11 or almost 22 million children are exposed to secondhand smoke. And the exposure of children to secondhand smoke increases asthma, pneumonia, croup by 60%, causes middle ear infection, it is the major cause of sudden infant death syndrome, and it induces asthma in asymptomatic children. I will tell you that um, I was small, but I had the flu in 1968. I had the Hong Kong flu, right? That was a pandemic. Now imagine, and I was hospitalized for viral pneumonia. I missed four months of school. Um, I lost a lot of weight. I was really, really very sick. And then when I was home, I was home with two adults that smoked in the house during winter. When I think about that and the fact that I survived that, it's amazing to me. Um, secondhand smoke linked to twice the caries risk in children. So this is a study that was published in the Journal of the American Dental Association. And exposure to secondhand smoke at four months of age was experienced by half of all of the children um, of that age in Kobe City, Japan. It is associated with an increased risk of caries in deciduous teeth. And they could not find or establish causality. This was an observational study rather than a randomized trial. What they did was they looked at uh, records of nearly 77,000 children born in Kobe City, Japan between 2004 and 2014, ages birth to three years old. So the ADA reported in October 2015 that infants exposed to secondhand smoke at four months old seemed more likely to develop caries by three years of age. The study, however, failed to find an impact of maternal smoking during pregnancy on caries development and deciduous teeth. The primary investigator, Dr. Koji Kawakami, stated education on the harm of secondhand smoke might increase if dentists became aware of the risk of caries due to secondhand smoke, as well as tobacco consumption of their clients. Secondhand smoke's adverse effects, the authors wrote, include the following. Inflammation of the oral membrane and impaired salivary gland function, a decrease in serum vitamin C levels. What this all leads to is a form of xerostomia, basically. Immune dysfunction, children exposed to passive smoking or secondhand smoking had lower salivary IgA levels higher levels of sialic acid with higher activity. So lower salivary IgA levels means that their immune function, their salivary enzymes were not able to um, protect them from the uh, pathogens. And the higher levels of sialic acid with higher activity enhanced the agglutination of mutans streptococci. And that led to the formation of dental plaque and caries. It made the bacteria able to stick to the enamel or the dentin, unfortunately, more easier, okay? So it was a form of xerostomia. It affects the components, the composition of their saliva. In addition to the direct effects of secondhand smoke, the inhibition of the morphology and mineralization of dental heart tissue and the offspring of rats exposed to passive smoking have also been reported. So what about secondhand smoke and the effect on non-smokers? Non-smokers who are exposed to secondhand smoke at home or work increase their heart risk by 25 to 30% and their lung cancer risk by 20 to 30%. In this Harvard study, Dr. Maria Glymore, 2008, found that spouses, non-smoking spouses, risk of stroke increased by 42% to exposure of secondhand smoke. 
And if they were a former smoker, their risk increased by 72%. And she stated that these findings indicate, findings indicate that spousal smoking increases stroke risk among non-smokers and former smokers. And the health benefits of quitting smoking likely extend beyond the smoker to affect their spouses and, as we know, their children, potentially multiplying the benefits of quitting smoking. Third-hand smoke. Third-hand smoke is the residue that you would find on surfaces like your drywall, um, flooring. Now, it is residual contamination that, that contains carcinogens. Facts, 43% of smokers, 65% of non-smokers believe that third-hand smoke causes harm to children. There is no safe level of exposure to tobacco smoke. Third-hand smoke contains more than 250 chemicals. Homes and cars where people have smoked can smell like cigarettes for a long time due to the third-hand smoke that's penetrated those surfaces. Uh, decontaminating a home or car used by a smoker can require expensive professional cleaning. It can stain the walls, the floors. Uh, the smell can remain in drywall, insulation, and other building materials. We had a rental home. We had someone in there who was smoking. They weren't supposed to. And basically, everything had to be decontaminated. Painters had to be brought in and so forth. Very, very costly. Especially the liability of renting a home to somebody else and potentially exposing them to a health risk. Smoking in a different room, using fans or candles or smoking in front of an open window does not prevent third-hand smoke. And, baby and babies and children can be harmed because they're breathing in toxic chemicals when they're crawling on the floors, they're sitting in the cars, or they're being held by adults. Third-hand smoke can settle on all of these surfaces, on clothing and so forth. Pets are also at risk because the chemicals from the smoke will stay in their furs or fur or feathers. So facts about quitting smoking, Mark Twain said, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Your patients have tried to probably quit multiple times. Even attempting to quit for 24 hours or less is counting as a quit attempt. And unfortunately, they will never be cured of the addiction. Nobody is ever cured of an addiction. They have to manage it. Um, the problem here is that for many of your patients, the best we can hope for is long-term abstinence. We may never see them fully quit. They may have long periods of time, and then they may go back into it. That is the nature, unfortunately, of an addiction. So nicotine, again, we said is the chemical in cigarettes that is the psychoaddictive drug that causes the addiction prevalent among patients with alcoholism and other drug dependencies. Smokers not only become physically addicted to nicotine, but they link their smoking with many social activities, such as um, you know, partying with their friends, eating, uh, drinking a cup of coffee, cocktails, whatever the case may be driving, making smoking an extremely difficult addiction to break. Uh, unknown, but it is said that cigarettes are the most efficient drug delivery system. You can deliver nicotine to the brain within just a minute or two. In this study, a Cochrane database review interventions for tobacco cessation in the dental setting, the conclusion here was the available Evidence suggests that behavioral interventions for tobacco cessation conducted by oral health professionals incorporating an oral examination component in the dental office or community setting may increase tobacco abstinence rates among both cigarette smokers and smokeless tobacco users. Now, the American Medical Association treats tobacco addiction as a primary disease, and diseases that are caused by tobacco use are considered secondary disease. What does that mean? If somebody is 
hospitalized for a disease that is caused by tobacco addiction, their primary diagnosis will be tobacco addiction. The secondary disease um, will be as a secondary disease. Why do they do that? Because they are going to want to start tobacco cessation while that person is um, in the hospital. So although the medical profession has traditionally viewed tobacco use as a risk factor for other diseases instead of a primary problem, this approach has impeded rather than promoted the development of optimal treatment methods for patients addicted to nicotine. So nicotine addiction is a primary medical problem deserving of thoughtful, ongoing attention from every responsible clinician. And diseases either caused or made worse by tobacco use should be regarded as complications of nicotine addiction. So when I read this and I apply it to dentistry, um, when we have a patient who's smoking a pack a day and they are presenting for an examination and they have periodontal disease and they've had attachment loss and we are now scheduling them for quadrant scaling and root planing, what are we expecting the prognosis to be? It's going to be pretty poor, right? If they are still a smoker, the same thing for implants. Um, the prognosis is poor. They need to understand the prognosis is poor. And their primary, their primary disease is tobacco use and the periodontal disease is a complication of their nicotine addiction. So our thinking has got to turn around a little bit as we apply this model to oral health. Again, multiple quit attempts are common. In 2012, an estimated 51.6 million adults were former smokers. And of the 42.1 million current adult smokers, 45.9 had tried to stop for at least 24 hours in the preceding year because they were trying to quit smoking completely. That does count as a quit attempt. Quitting smoking for good often requires multiple attempts using counseling or medication alone will increase their chance of a quit attempt being successful. But the combination of both is even more effective and that's where the quit lines will come in. Again, seven medications approved by the FDA, including nicotine patches, nicotine gum, nicotine lozenges available over the counter containing nicotine um, by prescription and nicotine nasal spray and inhaler and then we have Zyban and Chantix, which are non-nicotine pills. Those are the only seven approved by the FDA. Electronic cigarettes are not one of them. The benefits of quitting smoking short-term, lowered blood pressure within 20 minutes, increased peripheral circulation 20 minutes, carbon monoxide levels will drop within eight hours, improved smell and taste one week, Cilia regrowth, decreased mucus viscosity, one to nine months, increased lung function up to 30% within two to three months, and diminished fatigue one to nine months. Long-term benefits of quitting, the risk of cardiovascular disease returns to that of a non-smoker. Precancerous pre cells are replaced. The risk of oral throat, esophageal, bladder, kidney, pancreatic cancers decrease, and the risk of lung cancer decreases by 30 to 50% after 20 years, the reduction is greater. That statistic is a tragic one. As I said, in the case of my father, he had a massive heart attack in his early 50s, triple bypass uh, surgery, survived it all and 14 years later died of lung cancer. Tobacco dependence is complex. The biopsychosocial model, it's psychological, social, and biological factors that we have to take into consideration. And that is something that the quit lines are very good at. And we're gonna talk about referring your patients to the quit line. It's complex interaction. Um, and we have to address all of these factors in a quit attempt. So your patients that go cold turkey, that think they just have a bad habit, 
less than 3% of them will be successful. So the next time you have a patient who comes into your practice and they tell you, I quit smoking a month ago, they should still be referred to some sort of program. If they aren't in a program right now, if they aren't, definitely the quit lines because statistically, when they return to you for a recare appointment, they will no longer be a former smoker. So we know directly impacting any of these aspects of dependence can significantly affect the other two major components. Um, many smokers underestimate the risk to their health. More than 70% want to stop, 46% try to quit. Most will relapse within a few days. 75 to 80% will relapse within six months. And again, three to 5% will achieve freedom from tobacco yearly. 80% of smokers start before the age of 18. Symptoms of dependence can occur after the first few cigarettes. Adolescent smokers describe themselves as dependent and for occasional smokers, withdrawal symptoms can take days to appear. Biological cause is nicotine. There is no safe form. Nicotine takes seven seconds to reach the brain. And the biological tendency here is to maintain a steady state. So when we can't maintain a steady state, we call that cravings, right? That's the brain's system to try to achieve that um, balance. Tobacco withdrawal symptoms can be irritability, frustration, anger, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, increased appetite, weight gain, restlessness, impatience, depressed mood, dysphoria, and insomnia. Our role in impacting tobacco use reduction, we know that training programs are used to encourage health professionals to ask their patients if they smoke and then offer advice to help them quit. In this meta-analysis of 17 trials, they found that these training programs help professionals to identify smokers and then increase the number of people who quit smoking. So the programs also increase the number of people offered advice and support for quitting by health professionals. Now, combined findings from 14 studies, including over 10,500 participants, showed that tobacco interventions by dental professionals helped tobacco users to quit. And these findings were similar for smokeless tobacco users and smokers. The body of evidence reveals a significant increase in demonstrated benefit compared to earlier findings. This was the Dental Board of California case where it was alleged that this particular dentist did not meet the standard of care for failing to counsel this implant patient on tobacco cessation. So they identified the patient as a tobacco user. They did not recommend to the patient to stop smoking and they did not counsel the patient and refer them to a quit line or other program before they entered into treatment, which included implants, periodontal therapy, restorations, and so forth. We talked about the seven first-line medications. Um, let's talk about the model for treatment of tobacco use and dependence. This was the long way to school, let's put it that way. This was the long version here of what we used to call the model for treatment of tobacco use and dependence. General population, they enter your practice and you ask them for uh, their tobacco use. What's their history? You're going to screen them. You advise them to quit. You assess their willingness to quit. You assist them with quitting. You arrange for follow-up. Very lengthy. Dental practices are busy places. We needed a system that is quick that is effective and that we can get your patients into um, assistance very readily. So let's talk about what that system is. It's called the two A's and R. We ask about tobacco use. Do you currently smoke or use tobacco products? Then we advise them to quit. Quitting tobacco is one of the best things you can do for your health today, for your oral health today. I strongly encourage you to quit. Are you interested in quitting? Now, I usually tie it to whatever reason they happen to be there that day. I see you're here because you have a periodontal infection. 
I see you have um, mobility in your teeth, a lot of bone loss. Quitting tobacco is the best thing you can do for your oral health. We can try to get ahead of some of this, but we need to talk about quitting. Are you interested in quitting? Now, you may have a patient that says, you know, doc, I've tried to quit multiple times. I'm hopeless. I can't do it. I'm addicted. Um, this isn't the right time. I'm going through a divorce, whatever the case may be. The good thing is that you asked the question. So they're not ready. That's fine. What you want to do is document that very readily in the electronic records. We're going to talk about that. Give them hopefully a brochure that you can order for free from the quit line and say, when you're ready, we're here to help you. Here's some information on the quit lines that we'll refer you to. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. But we really, really urge you to consider. Okay. And then refer them to resources. So again, if they're ready to quit, you provide brief counseling and medication that is through the quit line. So we're going to refer them to the quit line. Um, we're going to talk about the quit lines here in just a second. And again, if they're not ready to quit, that's fine. We don't admonish them. We just say, let me give you some information. Every one of us is here to support you today. Use a personalized motivational message. I see that you have periodontal disease. I really want to help you get ahead of this get you into a stable condition, um, and it's going to take your efforts to quitting smoking to be able to do that. Okay, so the North American Quit Line Consortium, their headquarters is here in Phoenix, Arizona, and there are quit lines in every state of the U.S. and territories in Canada. They are funded by tobacco tax for the most part. They are a huge resource for your dental practice. How many of you are currently uh, aware of the quit lines or refer your patients to the quit lines? No right or wrong answer. Okay, so the great thing about the quit lines, yes, the, the California has um, a quit line. So the quit lines are great because, first of all, they're a free resource. So the number th one thing you want to do is find your state's quit line and register your dental practice. Make sure that your team, your staff has taken a course like this, any course out there, and that they get on the website because the website for your quit line will also offer more courses. In fact, many of them have programs like ours where they will come into your practice, give you free CE and train you all. Now, the program here that I managed in Arizona we actually had a contest and the practice that referred the most patients to the quit line got a free one page ad in Phoenix top docs. It was a very popular contest and the practices that were most successful were the ones who had their teams trained, especially their dental hygienist. So we have information in every practice, I'm sorry, every operatory Again, we're asking our patient, do you use or currently use tobacco products? It's not enough to just look at the health history and, and see what they've answered. Then advise them. I, as your dentist, I currently recommend, based on what I see today, that you quit using tobacco. Are you ready to quit? It's the best thing you can do for your oral health. And then you're going to get the yes or no or the, some, the gray area. If they say yes, you have your practice registered with the quit line. You can refer them to the quit line online. So they have a browser-based referral or they have fax. Arizona Quit Lines, ashline.org. 
Um, again, you can find your state by going to the North America Quit Line or just do a Google search, Quit Line for your state. Free resources for you, continuing education, brochures, information, free resources for your patients. Many of them offer free medication. They will counsel the patient. They will find out what kind of a smoker this patient is because the recommendation for medication can change. Um, they may have withdrawal symptoms at certain times. The counseling can help them with that. They may be on uh, Chantix and they may have them use nicotine gum when they have acute symptoms. That is something, these are professionals and they can do for you. Now this system, ask, advise, refer to A's and R is literally a two minute process in your practice, two minutes. Your assistant can get them entered and get them referred over to the quit line. Once you refer your patient to the quit line, what happens? They are going to keep you notified, help the patient determine a quit date. For my patients that smoked for years, I would coordinate that quit date, clean their teeth for the first time so that um, they can feel a mouth that is tobacco free as well. So they can readily see the benefits while they are quitting. Sometimes the patients that were able to stay tobacco free for three months, six months, we would whiten their teeth. We'd give them some trays so that they could see the benefits here, get some positive reinforcement. So again, number one thing, your homework is register your dental practice. Make sure your team knows how to use the quit line. Have them take some online courses. We have this course available online so that everybody understands their role. Okay, so that's ashline.org. Again, you can refer them either by browser or by fax. And California's is nobuts.org. Now, very briefly, since we have Dr. Birchman here, there is um, another utilization for photobiomodulation um, using acupuncture points or acupressure, meridian points, and assisting your patients with this technology to help them quit. So there's another utilization. I know that he has taught that course in the past. Maybe we can talk him into that again, but that is another modality that you can assist your patients with. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah, so Dr. Birchman said, not only do you stop smoking, but if you do smoke, it makes the cigarettes taste bad. Um, at the top of the screen, and I misspelled photobiomodulation, but, uh, or I mistyped it, I didn't misspell, I mistyped. If you tap on the red button, it'll take you to Dr. Birchman's site too, and all the free classes that you can take on photobiomodulation. So, Definitely go there and bookmark the website and you can sign up for those classes. Um, if you go to Ask the Experts, there are, I believe, eight recorded courses, uh, at least four. There's also the four new courses that'll be uh, launched at the end of August, September, I'm sorry, and then the comprehensive training in November. And then the symposium, August 21st on COVID-19. 
Okay, question. Um, what specific agent in tobacco causes lung cancer? Well, it's the TARS. You know, there's several chemicals plus carcinogens. So you have toluene. Um, there's a variety of chemicals, carcinogens that can lead to various dysplasias and cancers, not just lung, but oropharyngeal and so forth. Any other questions? Dr. Birchman, do you care to make any more comments? It's late back there. I see a few folks typing here. We do have a few minutes left here. So <laughs> thanks, Dr. Birchman. Well, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Birchman on this site. And again, um, photobiomodulation for dental practices. Many of your patients, unfortunately, are going to be experiencing long haul from COVID, um, COVID mouth, COVID tongue, and learning how to use photobiomodulation um, and these dedicated devices, which are very inexpensive, very inexpensive. Um, you can rapidly treat these patients and mitigate a lot of their ailments and, and symptoms. So it's a worthwhile modality to take a look at. All right, everyone, let's go ahead while questions are being entered. Um, if you could type yes into the chat area for role for AGD Pace. Okay, so um, be sure to take a look at the instructions in the chat area and as review, your attendance will be verified by Dental CE Academy. This is a very highly regulated industry, continuing education. Your instructions to um, receive CE verification will be sent to you here within 15 to 30 minutes, okay? Now, the course instructions you can download here and it'll explain that process to you. I highly recommend if you haven't, enter um, support at dentalcenow.com to your safe sender list. Because if you're using Hotmail, Yahoo, AOL, SBC Global, or you're using your dental practice domain, there is a possibility that your email will be blocked by your network. If you're using your dental practice, it should be blocked because your network administrator is trying to protect you from Trojan horses and so forth, okay? 
So please add that to your safe sender list. Again, the instructions will be coming to you within 15 to 30 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and close out the course if there aren't any other questions. Um, I want to thank you for attending. Please be sure to check the website for future courses. Have a wonderful 4th of July. Uh, we will be in full swing here currently after the holiday. There are a bunch of on-demand courses on the site if you need more CE. Be sure to take a look at the symposiums. You can order, um, you can uh, obtain eight CEUs. Dr. Birchman is giving you three free CEUs on August the 21st. All right. Okay, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, wonderful holiday. Thanks so much for taking the time, and we look forward to seeing you again.